episode, we are joined with Dr. Ron Herzman to discuss Dante and his Divine Comedy. Dr. Herzman is a professor of English who received his PhD from the University of Delaware and joined the Geneseo faculty. Did I say that right? Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> In 1969. Uh, Dr. Herzman, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. So what can you tell us uh, broadly about Dante? Uh, uh, who, who, who was he and, and, and what exactly is his connection in particular with, with Florence and, and, and Florentine politics? Because uh, as I understand it, Dante during his time lived in a very uh, politically turbulent uh, time for, 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 for Florence. Yeah, I think maybe the best way to start uh, to give the background is to say, first of all, it's necessary if we're going to find out something about his poem, that is to say, the Divine Comedy, because what Dante does is something quite unique in the history of epic poetry. Uh, Homer writes about Achilles and Hector. Uh, Virgil writes about Aeneas and Dido. Dante writes about himself. So the most interesting change that Dante makes to the tradition of epic poetry is that he is the protagonist. And in addition to that, that is to say, in addition to this sort of first person account, he makes it even more specific by telling us in the very first lines of the Divine Comedy, the opening of the Inferno, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood. Well, According to the way that uh, folks thought in Dante's time, uh, the the psalmist says we have three score years and ten, an allotted life is seventy. So midway through the journey, uh, places Dante at uh, age thirty five, and since we know that the poem takes place in thirteen hundred, what we also know is that Dante must have been born in 1265. So what we need to know to situate Dante is, as you say, a little bit about the uh, political nonsense that was going on in Florence during that time, because, of course, that's all integral to the poem. And in fact, uh, we see that it's even more integral when we realize that the poem itself was written somewhat later. In other words, it's not a diary. It's not an account of what was actually going on. Dante writes the poem at, at a later point in his life and from a very later, uh, I'm sorry, from a very different vantage point, which is to say in the year 1302, uh, Dante was kicked out of Florence for being on the wrong side of a political squabble. And that turned out to be the defining feature, really, of the poem itself because Dante is, in a sense, writing something that is is meant, at least in part, to come to terms with the fact that he's now in exile, that he spends the last 19 years of his life wandering around Italy. We're not quite sure of all the stops that he made and never got a chance to return to his native Florence. So with that as a kind of um, what what the poem actually gives us at the very beginning, what is it that we need to know to flesh that out in terms of the actual situation? Well, one thing that was very interesting is that in the year 1300, Dante would have been known in his own Florence as being a kind of political success story. He was an elected prior, the highest elected office in the city. And he also had a kind of, how do you want to put this, alternative career as one of the hotshot young gun poets uh, busy writing lyric love poetry in Florence. Dante was, at least from our vantage point, the best of the lot. So here we are uh, in the year 1300 when Dante chooses uh, to um, set the poem, okay? And yet he tells us that during this time of political and one might say artistic success, he was nevertheless in a dark wood, which is to say that the external success that Dante had at that time didn't seem to correlate to what was going on in this, we might as well give it the term, midlife crisis that he's going through. And I think part of it 
is precisely the fact that he realizes how messed up things are in Florence during that year because of the kind of factionalism that had torn the city state apart. So um, the short version, I think, of what we have to know about all of that is, number one, that Florence was what we would call an independent nation. It was an independent city state, you know, fixed in Tuscany there. And um, in a kind of curious relationship to the other independent city states, that they were always in one way or another competing with each other, uh, sometimes ep- economically, sometimes actually by out and out war. And in order to kind of back back up their own claims, uh, city-states would align themselves with larger outside forces. Uh, Again, very briefly, either the forces of the Pope or the forces of the Holy Roman Emperor. So I'm going to use the the magic G words here. The folks who align themselves with the Emperor were called Ghibellines, and the folks who align themselves with the Pope were called Guelphs. The Guelphs won in Florence. The Ghibellines are kicked out. But then a curious thing happens. The Guelphs themselves divide into two factions. And one faction, backing the emperor, was the faction that Dante belonged to, the faction that was on the losing side of, I think we could best call it a coup, uh, in 1301 that sent Dante out of Florence and that sent him out permanently by 1302. So, and probably by about 1304 or so, he figured out he was never going to get back. The usual pattern was, there was kind of this alternation. We kick you out, we come back, we kick you out. But Dante never got a chance to come back. So with all that taking place in Florence, one of the things that Dante does throughout the poem is examine this question of political factionalism and suggest that the root problem is that it doesn't really deal with what's good for the entire community. It only deals with what's good for one's particular party. So this is something that haunts Dante and and kind of haunts the Commedia itself. So here's Dante, exile and pilgrim, but he writes about things as they were in 1300 when he's at the height of his political and, if you will, poetic fame. And what would you say are some of Dante's literary antecedents and influences? I mean, Dante is constantly in his poetry alluding to classical uh, uh, figures in, in, in yeah. late antiquity. And Virgil obviously is is one of the bigger ones who, who influences Dante. Sure. Well, one of the things that I think is crucial is that by writing this as an epic, he is throwing his hat in the ring to be considered along with the big guys. He did not know Homer directly, but he certainly knew Homer's reputation. And Virgil's poem, The Aeneid, is some po- is a poem that he had studied to the point he probably had most of it memorized. So his decision to make Virgil himself the guide for almost the first two-thirds of the poem, for all of the Inferno and for a good deal for most of the second part of the Divine Comedy, the Purgatorio, what he's doing is saying, what you need to know about this poem is the way that it links its, his poem is the way that it links itself to that particular antecedent, uh, to Virgil's Aeneid. So uh, an awful lot of people would say that the Aeneid is the single most important literary source for Dante, uh, although I think with equal justification, one one could argue that it is the Aeneid and, and the Christian Bible. So uh, if you were to sort of situate Dante as a poet, that, that would be your starting point, I think. And what would you say is, if you could briefly sum up before we, we, we get into it, what is the structure of this poem, The Divine yeah. Comedy? Well, uh, he makes the structure uh, frighteningly clear by clear mathematical divisions. What he does is he writes a poem that has three parts according to the three generally accepted um, divisions of the Christian afterlife, hell, purgatory, heaven. 
And each of those three major parts is itself subdivided into what he calls cantos. Strange word, canto. It can mean I sing, can mean a song, but it's sort of the unit uh, that the Inferno Purgatorio and Paradiso is constituted by. So each of them, oh, somewhere between 120 and 145 or 150 lines of verse, an individual canto, which has its own beginning, middle, and end, tied together in patterns of 33. So 33, 33, 33. But there's also an introductory canto, which most people think is kind of an introduction to the whole poem, as well as just to the Inferno. And that gets Dante to the magic number 100. There are 100 cantos, in other words, in the Divine Comedy, uh, starting in the Inferno and ending up with a, a sort of a vision of, of the Divine at the very end of the Paradiso. So uh, in terms of its outward form, highly structured and a, a remarkable tour de force because Dante also does this with a very demanding, a very exacting verse form, uh, three line stanzas, uh, interlocking rhyme. So the first and third words, uh, the first and third ending words of any little little verse form, any little tercet rhyme. And then the middle one rhymes with the beginning of the next one. So it has this sort of A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C uh, structure through an entire canto. Now, it's a lot easier to do that in a language like Italian, which pretty much every word in which every word pretty much ends in a vowel, but it's still a pretty remarkable thing to do. And so Dante kind of sets these limits uh, on what he's doing or sort of says, here's, you know, um, uh, here's the self-imposed form that I'm giving myself. And the, the fact that he was able to pull it off for 14,000 plus lines is in itself an extraordinary remarkable achievement. So that's kind of the outward form. The other thing to say about that form is that if you take a look at it in terms of what happens to the um, Dante the Pilgrim, <clears throat> as he's called, that is to say Dante the protagonist of his own poem, uh, what you see is that he starts out in a dark wood and ends up with this vision of God at the end, which means that the the general trajectory of the poem from the point of view of, of Dante the Pilgrim is he's a guy who starts out dumb and ends up smart or starts out lost and ends up found, if you want to put it that way. So there's that that gives a kind of um, structure to the poem as well. And as I understand it, what's also going on in the background of the entire poem is, temporally speaking, it's it's Holy Week. Holy Week is sort of That's happening. Yeah. yeah, Holy Week of the year 1300. And so um, throughout the poem, but most especially in purgatory, it's linked up with the Christian liturgy uh, that, um, if you will, purgatory is kind of a liturgically dominated uh, penitential journey, okay? Uh, and uh, so there are all kinds of references to uh, the, 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 the specific uh, liturgy of Holy Week. And that Dante, uh, like Christ in uh, Christ on the cross, descends, uh, buried, resurrected at the end. Dante goes down into the pit of hell. Uh, following Jesus, he descended into hell and rises, uh, climbing the mountain of purgatory, and then uh, the journey outward to uh, the that which is beyond time and space in the Paradiso. So um, the governing uh, liturgical structure means that there are also references. Well, uh, people do a lot of hymn singing, for example, in the Purgatorio, uh, and those are you know, well-known Christian hymns that accompany the uh, the pilgrim and have a lot to do with what's going on at any stage along the way. Right, right. So then, if I can ask. How does Dante structure the Inferno or structure hell 
uh, why does he list the particular sins he does in in that particular order? Sure. Well, the basic principle, of course, is that the farther down into the pit you go, the more serious the sin. So sins are presented from less serious to more. That once we get into those specific sins that demand an encounter between Dante and one of the one of the damned souls that he meets, we start with lust at the top and we end with a kind of treachery and betrayal at the end. And once again, he's very systematic. What he does is divide that journey, that descent, into three discrete parts, what he calls incontinence, the beginning, then violence, and then fraud. Incontinence, uh, we're famously told in Inferno 5, is basically submitting reason to desire. Now, what's interesting about this structure is that, once again, Dante goes to very specifically pagan sources for this rather than Christian. They're sources, to be sure, that have been picked up by uh, Christian writers. But essentially, they spring all the way back, or they can be traced all the way back uh, to someone like Plato, who, who examines um, what, you know, what, what constitutes human beings and says, well, we're constituted by our desires, and, and by what he calls spiritedness, by this sort of desire to get ahead. And we also have the capacity to reason, which, again, for Plato is to, to be able to take the long view of things. And so if you look at uh, a flourishing human being, uh, having reason under control means that one has the virtue of moderation. Uh, if one has one's spiritedness under control, if one is an exemplar in that direction, then, then one has the virtue of courage. And if one is virtuously reasonable, uh, you've got uh, the, um, uh, the, the you, you have a, a, a person who, who has wisdom, right? What Dante does is say, all right, here we have moderation, courage, and wisdom, let's flip those around, let's turn those upside down and see what the opposite of those would be. In other words, rather than seeing them as virtues, let's see them as vices. Uh, if you don't have uh, your, your your desires under control, you're guilty of what he calls incontinence. Uh, if you are not, if you do not have the virtue of courage, flip that around, uh, what you have is violence. And then what you have Finally, the inverse of the virtue of wisdom is fraud. And fraud is the part of the commedia that Dante devotes most of his time to, uh, that we pick up fraud somewhere around Canto 18 of the 34 Cantos of the Inferno and trace that all the way down to the pit of hell. So uh, once again, in his very systematic way, Dante takes fraud and divides it into 10 separate categories, 10 separate pits, if you will, uh, on the way down. So the main thing that I want to emphasize is not just that he's being very systematic about it, but that it has a kind of um, it, it has a kind of ancestry. And that ancestry comes from the classical tradition, not the Christian tradition, so that there is this constant interplay interface between the two and that i think can be seen very easily in the fact that number one the guide down all of this is a down all of this pit of hell is a pagan and number two the very categories of hell itself are pagan categories rather than christian ones and if i can ask i uh... Was it at all normal for medieval culture to envision hell as a, as a city, especially an, an inverted uh, city? Uh, I, go ahead. Yeah, good question. Normal, not necessarily, but it was not necessarily an innovation on Dante's part either. Now, again, Dante, there were all kinds of journeys to the afterlife before Dante, but he kind of, um, after his, there's a sort of, what's the point? He's done it all. 
Uh, I think that might be one way to think about it. So I think that what Dante's accomplishment is, is the huge specificity with which all of this is spelled out you know, certainly going way beyond anything that was previous in, in the tradition. Um, right. Yeah, picturing hell itself, uh, there's a lot less of that in the Bible than fiery preachers would have you, would, would have you believe. And if I can maybe ask, uh, who does Dante primarily place in hell? I mean, one of the sort of caricatures you, you might hear from someone is that Dante simply puts all his political enemies in uh, into yeah. hell. But but I, I think if you read it carefully, it's yeah. a lot more complicated than, than that. He yeah. places people he loves very dearly, like uh, uh, yeah. Brunetto Latini in, in yeah. hell. Yeah, yeah. Those of, uh, and it's also interesting to follow that up uh, by the time that we get to purgatory as well, uh, because even though, some of his enemies are in hell. And as you say, some of his friends also. The same thing is true with purgatory. There are an awful lot of people among the saved that you would think both from the point of view of Dante's own life and from the point of view of um, what kind of life they led on earth, uh, you would not want, you, you would not expect to find them among the saved. But the most important thing to think about in that regard, well, other than to say, that the theory that Dante wrote hell so that he could punish his enemies, the, the closer you scrutinize it, the less uh, it holds up. Not to say that Dante wasn't getting a lot of pleasure out of seeing some of his enemies down. And I think particularly uh, uh, popes. Uh, it, but it, it, it's really important to see that the fundamental thing about the afterlife, uh, when I'm teaching the poem, I often ask my students at the outset the question, what do you have to do to be a card-carrying member of Dante's afterlife. And most of them get, well, you have to be dead. Uh, and then I say, well, good. Uh, what what about, uh, is there a cutoff? A cutoff, yes, it, it's the year 1300, because that's when Dante takes the journey. So anyone who lived before 1300, fair game for Dante. There's a um, character with Meet in the Inferno, in Inferno 27, a guy named Guido de Montefeltro, who, um, Late in life, he became a friar, entered uh, uh, at Assisi, and he died in 1298. So he's somebody who barely made the cut. <clears throat> if we follow Dante all the way up the ladder to paradise, one of the people that he has an encounter with, an interesting conversation, is with Adam. Well, it's pretty hard to find anybody who goes back farther than that. So dead by 1300 means, wow. You've got an awful lot of people there that you can deal with. And the next thing that I ask is what separates those who are in the inferno from those who are in the other parts of the afterlife? And inevitably, they say, well, those uh, who are in the inferno were sinners. That wrong, because everyone in the poem is a sinner. The question is whether they have repented or not. So repentance is the fundamental thing that separates the damned from the saved. So we get all kinds of interesting people uh, in the Purgatorio who made uh, conversions of one sort or another. And in Paradiso, uh, we see people who uh, led rather sketchy lives, but who had a conversion at the end. So that, that question of conversion is sort of the most important thing that you might want to say uh, about who gets what designation in the afterlife. Now, it turns out that even though Dante has free reign, if you will, to put anybody in there that he wants, so long as they're dead by 1300, and even though we do get uh, quite an interesting geographic spread, if you take a look at the poem as a whole, it's interesting to see that in the Inferno and in Purgatorio, for the most part, the people are Italians, often Florentine, who lived within a generation or two of Dante's own lifetime. So um, there, there, there's a lot of, I'm looking at the stuff that's most relevant to me in what Dante is talking about there. One other thing that complicates it enormously 
Dante does not differentiate between what we would call real people and what we would call fictional characters. And they exist side by side. So one really crazy example, Dante's guide is Virgil. A number of people that we meet in the afterlife turn out to be characters from Virgil's own poem. The example I use that brings it home to my students is that if you walked into a bar and at one end of the bar um, drinking a Guinness and having a good time with his pals, there's Shakespeare. At the other end, all by himself in his inky black downing vodkas was Hamlet. And they're, you know, there they are at the same place and at the same time. That's the game that Dante plays throughout. And it's an enormously complex one and has all kinds of interesting ramifications. Most obvious thing to say is that it opens up far, far greater possibilities. For one thing, just to continue the example, we know a whole lot more about Hamlet than we do about Shakespeare because great authors are able to take us inside their characters in a way that, um, uh, you know, the the few facts that we know about Shakespeare's life, we, we don't know. So an awful lot of the characters who are there who already have, uh, if you will, a literary life in their own poem, when they're incorporated into Dante, they come bringing that life with them. And even with respect to these characters, Dante isn't afraid to embellish their stories oh, or no. to make, like, 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 like with Ulysses, he bring, he brings this account of how he went on this last absolutely. voyage and absolutely um the the phrase that i like the one that i think uh, best describes that is that dante fictionalizes history and historicizes fiction so that the fundamental operating premise is that all of these things have the same level of reality and in the famous words of uh, Dante scholar by the name of Charles Singleton, the fiction of the commedia is that it's not a fiction. So we're there, we're taking this journey. And what enables him to do this is that because he's meeting these folks in the afterlife, they come with, if you will, the infallible judgment of God. So that if you know, somebody that we thought was a wonderful exemplar of a particular virtue, and we find him deep in hell, uh, it turns out that's, from the point of view of the poem, that's the real story. And so Dante's embellishments have that kind of imprimatur to them. All right, so we, we've talked a great deal about, a bit about the Inferno structure, but I figured we can maybe move on to maybe the, the Purgatorio. How yeah. does Dante envision the pur purgatory it's interesting that, that he conceives it as like a seven-story mountain or that, yeah. that's what's purgatory yeah. well the first thing to say about purgatory is that unlike either of the other two realms it's a place of change the folks there are in the process of turning themselves into souls capable of sustaining beatitude in other words, heaven is an acquired taste and the liturgically supercharged climb up the mountain is the place that the souls acquire the taste. And what Dante uses to structure this climb, the mountain, as you said, seven stories, each of those stories corresponds to what are called the capital sins or the deadly sins. Again, a kind of Christian notion to balance out the pagan one, but those two are very closely interrelated. According to this idea, according to the idea of the seven deadly sins, they are the root tendencies that are responsible for all of our bad actions, starting with pride, the most serious at the bottom, and then at the end, ending up at uh, the terrace of the lustful, uh, the least serious as they make the climb. And so uh, what happens is once again, he meets in each of these terraces souls who are uh, in a certain sense 
in the process of purging themselves of a particular deadly sin. But the difference between them uh, and the souls that he's met in purgatory is precisely the fact that they're in progress, that they are moving along also. And so uh, unlike the kind of static, um, what happens in hell is that there's just simply a tape that keeps playing for each of the souls. They're not going anywhere. They keep telling the same story over and over and over again. Uh, the story changes as they climb up the mountain of purgatory. So um, not surprisingly, what you have, best way to put it maybe, it's just a kind of basic visual, uh, hell is a place of darkness. Paradiso is a place of light. Purgatory is a place where light and darkness alternate. We actually have days there and nights. Nights, they all rest. Nothing much happens. And they start climbing again. Uh, so that what we have is something that is much closer to uh, the way life is experienced on Earth. And um, you have Dante himself purging, uh, being purged of the sins as he climbs the mountain. And then if I can maybe uh, follow up, uh, Dr. Hersman, how exactly does Dante structure the severity of the deadly sins is there any sort of where, where one is sort of more severe than the other is is, is uh yeah, yeah. are the more yeah. severe ones at the base I and mean, how, yeah. how does dante understand that so the more severe ones are at the base and he spends um a lot of time in 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 the terrace of pride not only focusing on that particular deadly tendency but if you will on giving us the rules for understanding all of them and so, once again, he takes a kind of Aristotelian notion. How do we learn things? Uh, Aristotle says, well, we learn things by precept and by example and by practice. Well, what you have is exactly that in the souls who are climbing the terrace, that they, for instance, what you have on um, the terrace of purgatory, it's, it's a mountain, so that means you're climbing it, and the inside uh, provided the opportunity for these sort of sculptures that are there that are examples of the opposite virtue to pride, that is to say the virtues of humility. Uh, so those give you the examples. Uh, there's also sort of a spoken, um, in, in all of them, a kind of uh, um, spoken virtue, if you will. And then the souls are in the process of undergoing various forms of... Um, Penance, I guess, would be the best way to talk about it. So if pride ultimately is mistaking your own place in the universe, uh, from Dante's point of view, seeing yourself as the center of the universe, then what happens is that you learn humility. Well, quite literally, what happens here is that the souls have are, are carrying big rocks and are all bent over uh, to learn the virtue of humility. So what you see is that sort of being worked out in in different uh, ways, and the examples uh, that they're shown in different media, if you will, uh, almost always consist of a story from the Old Testament, a story from the New Testament, and a story from the classical world. So in particular, when we're there at the Terrace of Pride, we've got sculpted into the side of the wall uh, a story from the New Testament, the Annunciation, we have a story from the Old Testament, the story of David dancing before the ark, and then we have a story from the Emperor Trajan. Uh, and interestingly enough, all of those folks uh, show up again at the very end of paradise, that is to say, at the very beginning uh, of, the, <clears throat> of the actual experience, the very, very last canto of paradise. The last thing that we see is a prayer by Dante's third guide, a monk and mystic named Bernard of Clairvaux, addressed to the Virgin Mary. So Mary starts the whole thing out <clears throat> with his, the depiction of with the depiction of the Annunciation, and we're told there that that's what opened the gates of heaven to us. Well, Dante's entrance there uh, comes with a prayer to the Virgin. So, uh, and, and the poem is good at that. It's something that we see. Uh, in in an earlier part of the poem is picked up later on, and uh, the poem is constantly kind of building on itself. 
And it's very interesting that you say that uh, Trajan is taken as an example of someone who's virtuous and he actually ends up making it into heaven despite being yeah. mm-hmm. a pagan. It, it, it seems to suggest that even for, for Dante, some figures uh, in, in the classical period, maybe like, I don't want to say are good enough to, to make it to make it into heaven, but Dante sort of gives them a privileged place wow. outside of uh, of Inferno. Like even Cato is, I think, he's, Cato I think he's on the, the short mystery. Cato is the big mystery. He's on the right side. And uh, so folks uh, have been arguing, debating, uh, positing theories for the last, you know, 700 years, uh, exactly why. But it's interesting to see how one reads it, okay? You can either look at that as saying, well, we do know, and we're told this in parody, so that God's ways are not ours, and to really be able to fathom to, you know, to the depth what the will of God is, uh, not, not something we can do. So with that as your kind of hermeneutic principle, if you will, you can say, Cato's there, don't know why, but God works in strange ways. Or you can say, Cato's there. Does that mean that since somebody who seems like such an unlikely court, uh, choice is there, uh, does that possibly mean that there's hope for lots of pagans rather than just the specific examples that we have? And <clears throat> one of the things that supports this, this is a little hobby horse of my own. I just sort of finished a long piece on the salvation of the pagan world. But one of the most interesting things to think about is that at the very, very beginning of the Inferno, we get that famous first circle where all the virtuous pagans are. You got Aristotle, you got Plato, you got all these writers. That was Virgil's home before he gets his battlefield commission to bring Dante uh, uh, down into hell and up the mountain. And they are there, and unlike any other part of hell, there's no particular punishment. And unlike any other part of hell, they get to talk to each other. You know, they have kind of a a little philosophic community thing going on there. Well, one of the things that Dante does that is, I think, especially brilliant, is that he says that this particular place was also the place where the Old Testament prophets, everybody from Adam to John the Baptist, hung out before Christ's death and resurrection. In other words, it was Christ's entry into heaven after his death that brought them along with him. So what you're seeing is the only place in hell that is not static. Over the gates of hell, we have the famous abandoned hope, all ye who enter here. And then we get to a place where, in fact, people were and are not now. Well, can this at least suggest that we should not entirely give up hope for the salvation of the virtuous pagans? And I would argue that there are all kinds of interesting places in purgatory and in paradiso where we see the salvation of pagans. Trajan is one, Cato is another. The most interesting is the classical poet Statius. And what makes him particularly interesting is that Dante builds a case in Purgatorio 21 that Statius was converted to Christianity by reading Virgil. So when you unpack all of that, What might that say, not simply about Statius, is he just a one-off, or is this a way of saying that there is something salvific about pagan poetry that, when understood properly, might lead us to Christian truth? And if you add to the fact And here's the thing that has always puzzled me, and I don't think that there's been a very good answer to it. Virgil is a very likely guide, almost an inevitable guide to take Dante through hell. Because what the poet does is that he models his geography of hell on what Virgil said about hell in book six of the Aeneid. He's really piggybacking on that and depending on it enormously. And so (laughs) 
you know, in a sense, what you have is the expert to guide you down through these realms. But what happens when we get to purgatory? This territory is as unique, or I'm sorry, this territory is as new to Virgil as it is to Dante. Virgil really can't be a great deal of help. I mean, it gives him a lot of buddy support. And, you know, he's their friendship is important for the climb. But Virgil, he don't know more than Dante does about this. Well, seems to me that it makes sense to say that this is as much a learning experience for Virgil as it is for Dante. If that's the case, what happens when Virgil goes back down uh, to where all the virtuous pagans are? He now knows stuff that he didn't know before, and they all talk to each other. Remember, purgatory is the place that is time sensitive. Things happen there. So again, I'm just simply throwing this out as a possibility, but it's interesting when you take a look at all of those creatures uh, that we find in Paradiso who seem to be very unlikely. The most unlikely is a guy named Rafaeus, who is a walk-on character in Virgil's Aeneid. He gets two lines in the Aeneid, and he's there saved in Paradiso. So once again, you can look at it in one of two ways. Rafaeus is saved, but his very creator Virgil isn't. God's ways are not our ways. Or if Rafaeus is saved, can we not also hold out hope for Virgil? Uh, most of the folks throughout the long, long history of Dante commentary have not really wanted to engage that issue to the extent that they're willing to say, hey, maybe we don't have it right here about the salvation of the pagan world. But I think it's something that needs to be opened up. Fascinating. Yes. Uh, well, then, if, if, if I could then, maybe this is a good segue into uh, the Paradiso. How exactly does uh, does Dante, well, first of all, who is it that leads Dante through uh, Paradise? I know at a certain yeah. point, it's technically yeah. it's two characters, but yeah. at the, the, the height of Purgatory, yeah. Virgil stops guiding Dante and, and Beatrice, yes. Be Beatrice yeah. takes over. Yeah. So to backtrack just a little bit, one of the things that I mentioned early was that Dante, uh, by the year 1300, was a well-known hotshot lyric poet. The most important of his works was a sequence of poems that revolved around, around that focused on a woman named Beatrice. And he puts these poems together, together with a commentary, and publishes a work called the Vita Nuova, The New Life. Had Dante not written the Divine Comedy, he would still be one of the great Italian poets because of the Vita Nuova itself. And at the end of the Vita Nuova, there's this very mysterious uh, comment where Dante says, I hope to have the opportunity to write about her again in a way that she deserves. Well, a lot of people think that either that was real good luck on Dante's part or that he already had something like the Commedia in mind. But whatever the case, he meets Beatrice at the end of Purgatory, and she becomes his guide through Paradiso until we get to the very, very, very end when she hands the baton to, as we said before, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, a sort of famous 12th century mystic and, and theologian who is Dante's final guide. So Beatrice is uh, to almost all of Paradise what Virgil was to the Inferno and most of Purgatorio. And what I would say about her that I think is something that needs to be presented as a kind of highlight is that in the Paradiso, Dante meets a great many theologians, uh, philosophers, mystics, holy men. The most important theologian in the Paradiso is Beatrice in terms of what she explains to Dante. So, um, you know, this is kind of an interesting thing. There's Thomas Aquinas, who has a really good speaking part in the Commedia. Uh, and uh, there's Bonaventure. Uh, Dante had good taste in who he, you know, picked for his his, his spokespersons. Uh, and in a, in a very real way, they are outshone by uh, what we uh, learn from Beatrice. So uh, she is his guide. 
And it's a different kind of journey, of course. He's moving toward, here's the problem with Paradiso. How do you write about what is not in space and time when all you have is space and time to do it? And so what Dante does is construct a journey that's moving toward the final ineffable end by having sort of stopping places along the way as the pilgrim ascends. And where he stops is what you would see in the so-called Ptolemaic universe. In other words, what uh, what the solar system looks like from the point of view of being you know, there on Earth. So he goes through the sphere of the moon, Mercury, um, Venus, Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn, then the fixed stars, and then uh, into uh, what is heaven itself, if you will, uh, the Empire and the Empyrean. And in all of that, what he ingeniously does is have all of those places as stopping points where souls are located while Dante is taking the journey. In other words, if you ask yourself the question, where are the souls in heaven? Well, they're all surrounding the throne of God in this sort of timeless act of praise, but they take time out to let Dante visit them. It's kind of like a the set of a, a play where the play is over and you strike the set. So they're there for Dante's listening and dining pleasure as he travels up through these spheres and once again, each of those spheres is associated with a particular virtue. So Dante can kind of set it up <coughs> that he he meets um, appropriate souls on the way. And just to say something about that in terms of the whole poem, this is not a, you know, this this is not a, you know, a total or a, um, a, a totalizing thing. But for the most part, when Dante is chatting with folks in the Inferno, he's dealing with people who have some kind of political connection, who have some kind of political life. When he's in the Purgatorio, it's mostly with artists uh, of one medium or another. When he's in Paradiso, he's mostly with philosophers, theologians, and other, um, uh, uh, other folks like that. Even though the political theme is just as strong in Purgatorio as it is in Inferno, and just as strong in Paradiso as it is in Purgatorio. And then with respect to the structure of the the, the Paradiso, uh, it, it, as you said, it's it's uh, from the perspective of, you know, a, a medieval Christian, the Ptolemaic model of the different uh, spheres of heaven. As I understand it, Dante, sort of divides these spheres and associates them with either uh, the cardinal virtues or or uh, yeah the the the, the, yeah. the the theological virtues yeah so uh briefly he's very interesting here because he's got to fit the virtues to the model that he has and uh, the association of these planets or spheres with the virtue is already there for him, okay? It, it, Mars and, you know, uh, fortitude, not a surprise. Uh, Saturn with um, uh, contemplation, which, of course, is uh, an extension of the virtue of moderation and so on. So what he does is a very tricky thing. Uh, the first three that he goes through, uh, Moon, Mercury, Venus, associated with... Um, faith, hope, and charity, the souls who are there are souls who back on earth lacked some aspect of that particular virtue rather than being souls who were exemplary of it. Now, that's kind of an interesting move on Dante's part. Part of it is that means that he's able to uh, sort of negotiate a, a, um, a paradise where... Um, even though from a Christian point of view, those three theological virtues are more important than the cardinal virtues, uh, Dante kind of flips it and has those first, but has it as though there's a lack. So that at the very end of the journey, when Dante has gone through all of those seven virtues and seven spheres, he's in the fixed stars and he himself is given an examination in faith, hope, and charity by St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. So that notion of using the, the virtues uh, in a pretty um, powerful way uh, throughout the Paradiso uh, 
And so the souls that he has who are exemplary of those virtues uh, once again speak to Dante, although in a quite different mode than what we would see in the Inferno. And does Dante in this, uh, in Paradiso, I, I know that we talked a lot about how Dante makes a lot of political or social points in the Inferno, but would it be at all correct to say that he makes any sort of points in the Paradise? I know that there are several times where uh, I think he meets like Peter yeah. Damien and talks about the corruption uh, of, of clerics or things of that of that sort. Uh, sure. Um the most scathing condemnation comes from St. Peter himself, uh, who uh, at, at, at the end of Dante's examination sort of goes ballistic about what's happening back on earth. And the very last words of Beatrice herself, uh, you know, not, hey, Dante, have a good life. Uh, it's uh, a, a stinging condemnation of simoniac popes, of popes who... Uh, used used spiritual weapons for political gain and uh, i think that um one of the ways to think about it is that the farther up you go toward the divine the more you can see the discrepancy on earth between what should be and what is down there so the prophetic urgency of the poem itself increases the farther along the journey that you go. And somehow he manages to blend this with um, the um, Dante's movement along what, what really has to be best defined as a kind of mystical journey, a mystical ascent to the absolute. I see. I think that's covered pretty much everything that that I wanted to cover. Uh, it's great today. Do you have any? Well, I, do you have any recommendations for maybe a translation of the Commedia? Do you have any maybe secondary source literature yeah. you'd recommend? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's very interesting about translations is if you put five dentists in a room and say, "What translation would you give?" They, you'd get eight opinions. Okay. Uh, and so mine has a lot to do with the apparatus as well as the translation. The most, uh, most importantly, I, I would want you to have a dual language where the Italian's on the other side. No matter what you've studied or not studied, you can get some of that. It's also pretty easy to find the commedia spoken out loud. You can just go on the, the Princeton website, among other things, and hear the commedia spoken. What I recommend is to have the English on one side and uh, the other, uh, and and listen listen to the Italian while you're reading the English. Among the translations that I like, uh, the one by Derling and Martinez that's published by Oxford, I think that's terrific. Uh, the Hollander translation, I think that's Doubleday, and a translation by Stanley Lombardo, fairly recent, which I uh, that's the one I'm going to use in my Dante course this semester, because the commentary there each of the three volumes, each of the three canticles, the commentary was written by a different person. And I'll tell you why that's important. Folks who set out to write a commentary for the entire Commedia usually are pretty tired by the time they get to Paradiso. So the famous Singleton translation, which for a long time was kind of the standard work in the late 20th century, um, his commentary on the Paradiso was just simply not as good as the other parts. And so um, uh, there, the Hollander version has the most complete commentary. Its problem is that maybe that's not the best one to come to if you're coming to Dante for the first time, because he's speaking about things that are of concern to other scholars. And oftentimes he's considering it from the point of view of people who are, you know, immersed, engaged in this uh, long tradition of Dante commentaries, which was there right from the beginning. It's it's not something that we moderns do that's much different from what they did in the early manuscript editions, where there already were glosses and commentaries on a work that was so learned. I see. Well, Dr. Hersman, thank you so much for joining with us today. You're welcome.